Bibles now to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. We're going to be picking up in verse 57. We're going to go on through chapter 8, verse 15. And believe it or not, next week we are actually going to finish the book of Matthew. It's only been two years in the book of Matthew. That's okay. Before that, we spent two years in the book of Revelation. So, and if you're wondering where we're going next, we're going to the book of Romans, beginning in two weeks. We'll be going again slowly in depth through the book of Romans. Very important book in understanding our great salvation that we have in Jesus. But this morning, Matthew 27, beginning with verse 57, but by way of introduction, up to this point we've seen already that Jesus was betrayed, denied, beaten, crucified, even to the point as we saw last time forsaken by the father as he took on himself the sins of the world everything had been done specifically in fulfillment of the scriptures now the truth of the resurrection which is what we're going to be looking at today is easily verified historically in fact several well-known people who have sought to disprove it have ended up becoming believers just by looking at the evidence one is a famous law lawyer from the past named simon greenleaf and there's actually a school of law named after him now but he did that josh mcdowell was another lawyer at the time who sought to um, disprove the resurrection he became a believer and then you may have heard of lee strobel also he that movie was out the case for christ he was a reporter for the chicago tribune and sought to go out there and disprove the resurrection he became a believer so you know you run into these guys who say uh, i don't believe the resurrection i don't believe that happened just challenge them prove it. You say it did not happen. Go look at the historical evidence. Put the ball in their court. You know, if you just tell them things very often, they won't receive it. But if you challenge them, are you serious? You know, you know, don't say it in a derogatory. Are you serious? But, you know, challenging them, are you really serious about that? Are you, or are you just repeating what somebody else says? Are you just repeating talking points? Or you know, if you're honest, are you serious? Go check it out for yourself. Go check out the real historical evidence. So as we look at this passage today, we're going to see this question that really every person has to answer for themselves, and that is, what do you do about a risen Savior? What do you do about it? How do you handle it? Because you, you see, that's the question for all times. That's the question is that everyone, no matter where they come from, no matter what their quote unquote philosophical background is or whatever, what do you do with Jesus? What do you do with this risen savior? And first we see in verses 57 to 66, as these guys did, as these Jewish leaders tried to do, you to try to prevent the work of God from the beginning. As we read in verses 57 to 61, first of all, it says, Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself also became a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth 
and laid it in his new tomb, which had been hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. Now, when the Romans would crucify someone, they would either, they either left the body there on the cross for the animals or they would bury them in a mass grave. Pilate was the person giving all the orders and care, as to carrying out the sentence of Jesus. So he was the only one who could give permission for anything to be done out of the ordinary, beyond the routine. The guys had their orders, but, you know, Joseph, and actually, as we, as we see in the other Gospels, one of the other Gospels, that Nicodemus went with him as well. And they go to Pilate, and they receive permission to take the body. And that reference for, for uh, well... Joseph actually was one of the members of the Sanhedrin as well. He and Nicodemus were probably left out of the earlier proceedings when they tried Jesus because they knew the other members of the Sanhedrin who were trying to destroy Jesus knew that they were sympathetic to Jesus. So that's why they had their trial at night, which was totally illegal against Jewish law and everything to condemn someone in a night trial. Now these two men, Joseph and Nicodemus, they were emboldened by the things that had taken place, take their stand for Jesus even if it's in their own weak way at this time. It's important to remember. We see how, you know, these feeble things happen. We see the women looking on, devoted to Jesus, but all of them with no power. The reason being, Jesus hadn't yet, Jesus was now crucified, hasn't risen yet, the Holy Spirit has not been given, so of course they didn't have any power. So we shouldn't look uh, too dismissively or derogatorily at these people, of course they couldn't do anything. We wouldn't have been any different. You can see the things going on in their hearts, though, because of this action they were, they were taking here. This action they were taking, it would have made them ceremonially undefiled, and they wouldn't have been able to offer the, or be involved with the Passover, not realizing probably that they were involved more in the Passover than they knew, the real meaning of the Passover, that Jesus had become our permanent Passover lamb, the sacrifice, the true Passover, the one for which the one from the Old Testament, from the book of Exodus, was only a foreshadowing, was only a type, was only an obscure picture. What, and the question for us is, what does it take for you to make a stand for Jesus in those social situations, in those work situations, whatever it is, maybe with family as well, when you get into those discussions, whether it be quote unquote about religion or would it be just about the way you live your life, are we willing to take a stand and say the reason I am who I am the reason I do what I do is simply because I believe Jesus is exactly who he said he was and did exactly what he said he was going to do, and he's risen. If we'll simply do that, that cuts through so many of the arguments. But, you know, we find sometimes if, if we kind of, in those conversations, waffle, it just makes things worse. It, get, it just gets more complicated. So just tell them flat out. 
Now these two, according to John 1939, bring 75 pounds of spices to, they didn't embalm in Israel, they did that in Egypt, but what they would do in Israel is as they would wrap a body, they would put spices in there as well. And I mean, these guys are going over the top, 75 pounds of spices, that's like, you would do for a king or, or, you know, someone like that. And they took a long linen cloth and they, what they would do is they wrapped it around the body. They wrapped it around Jesus' body. Now, I don't know if you ever pay attention in the news that periodically comes out about the Shroud of Turin. I think it's kind of interesting because last week they made a statement of further researchers who said, you know, that there's something wrong with the bloodstain patterns as that, you know, they weren't natural. They were like they were dripped on there rather than that. And my whole opinion is about this route of turn. It really doesn't matter. So what? You know, what? It's just really irrelevant. It doesn't seem to, to me to fit the description of how uh, a body was wrapped, just being laid over the top. That seems more like a photographic image. Anyway, they lay the body, or he lay, specifically, Joseph lays the body in his own tomb. It was new. It was fresh. Now, Often what they did back then is, and we, you see that a lot if you go to Israel, go into Jerusalem, all of the area from the Temple Mount on up to Golgotha is part of Mount Moriah, where Abraham sacrificed or was going to sacrifice Isaac. And this is where it's really important because, you know, when they get into arguments about where these things took place. But beside the point, that was the reason it looks differently now and it might not look like it's continuous is because they used to quarry stones there as well. That's why Golgotha, which means the place of a skull, looks like a skull because they quarried it out. And, you know, you have these holes in there that look like the eyes and the nose of a skull on, on that. But what would, take, what would happen is when they quarried, often in quarries, when they were finished, they would use those quarries that they would dig out for tombs in those quarries. And, and, and so that's probably what was taking place here. So they put the body, they put Jesus' body in the tomb, and then they roll this large flat stone over the entrance. That's what they would do back then. They'd get these large, which would probably weigh close to ton, ton and a half, two tons. Really, you know, you're talking about a a big slab of stone around six feet high, six feet in diameter. And so there would be a groove in front of the it would usually go down like that into a groove. They'd roll the stone down into it. It would basically lock in there because you were in kind of a V down there at the bottom. And it would take a lot of people to move that. You couldn't just, you know, it's not one, it wasn't on hinges or anything. It wasn't just, you know, an easy open door sort of situation. You know, it wasn't like our supermarket stores where you walk in, got an electric eye, and it just opens. It was, you put somebody in there, and the intention was you don't take them out. So, after they did that, they leave Mary Magdalene and the other Mary who had been following, they had been following all along, and they sat across from the tomb in the garden for a while, desiring still to be close to Jesus and to watch. They had an incredible devotion to Jesus. 
even when they thought there was no hope left. Their worlds in their minds had fallen apart, but they waited and they watched. In verses 62 through 64, we read, On the next day, which followed the day of preparation. So we're talking about crucifixion on Friday, next day, which was the day of preparation. Next day was the Sabbath. It was a Saturday, which followed the day of preparation. The chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, What they actually said was, Lord. We remembered while he was still alive how the deceiver said, after three days I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say, To the people, he has risen from the dead, so the last deception will be worse than the first. The day after the crucifixion, the Sabbath, all of these priests and Pharisees come to Pilate. And remember, these are two groups that usually don't get along. The chief priests were mostly Sadducees who were kind of liberal guys who didn't believe in any resurrection. They didn't believe in spirits or angels, and they didn't believe in an afterlife. They thought, you know, it's just all here. And then you had the Pharisees, who were the legalists of the time. They tried to stay strict with the scripture in their legalistic way. And you had these two contradictory groups come together both over Jesus and what to do about him. It's amazing to me. They're still afraid of Jesus when he's in the tomb. And the fact that they were doing this on the Sabbath demonstrated that they were worried. Because they were running the risk, and remember, this is a Sabbath during the Passover, so it's this high holy day. They're risking being made ceremonially unclean so they can deal with Jesus. we got to deal with this. So they meet Pilate in his courtyard, probably, and they actually referred to him as Lord. As I said, the New King James translates it, sir, but the word is kurios which is translated Lord in other situations. They had declared, as John tells us in chapter 19, verse 15, that they have no other king but Caesar. When Pilate asked if they would have their king crucified, referring to Jesus, they declared, we have no king but Caesar. And so they go to Caesar's representative now and refer to him as Lord. They're rejecting the true Lord for a a man in order to protect their power. They remind Pilate that Jesus said that he would rise after three days. Interesting to me that those, basically the enemies of Jesus understood what Jesus taught better than his disciples did. Because the disciples had run away and they were off hiding. But the Pharisees and the chief priests said, oh, he said he's going to rise in three days. We got to do something about this. They wanted the tomb to be secured so that the disciples couldn't steal the body and claim that he had risen. Now, the chief priest didn't believe in the resurrection, but they thought that his disciples might. They said that if this happened, if the body was taken, the last deception would be worse than the first. By the the first deception that they're referring to in their minds 
was that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus was the coming Messiah whom he claimed to be, that the scripture foretold. They didn't receive him as such. They had him crucified. And now they're saying, if the body's gone, this deception will be worse than the original one. Really, these are the central issues relating to Jesus that everyone has to deal with. Is he who he claimed to be, and did he do what he said he was going to do? And if we have truly come to know him, what we are doing is staking everything on those two claims. I am not only betting my life, but my eternal destiny on the fact that Jesus is God the Son, come in the flesh to die for my sins on the cross, that whoever receives him should not perish but have everlasting life, and that that was testified to, that was proven by the fact that he rose from the dead. That's the challenge for each and every person. Do you believe? Do you believe? Are you trusting fully in Jesus Christ? Now in verse, verses 65 and 66, we read, Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Pilate gives the Jewish leaders a guard and tells them to do what they need to do to make the tomb secure. A guard usually consisted of four to 16 soldiers. A security force. And then a cord was put over the top of the stone. As I said, the stone was probably about six feet wide. And then they would take a clay seal. Well, they would make a clay seal on either end, sealing the stone to the facade of the tomb. So there's no way you could open that anyway without breaking the seal. And behind the seal was the full weight of Roman authority. The penalty for breaking a Roman seal was death. You couldn't do that. No one would take that lightly. And so you have that sealed tomb. You have that security force there. The guard would be left there for the designated time, those three days. Notice it was a day afterward, so they wanted, to be, they wanted the guard to be there past the three days that Jesus had talked about so they could then say, hey, see, he didn't rise. They were about preventing deception in their minds, but really they were tr involved in the greatest deception. Everything they did, and I, I love this, I love the way God works in the middle of this that we see, is because everything they did to prevent either Jesus rising from the dead or the disciples from stealing the body, you know, they thought, well, you know, we'll prove he wasn't the Messiah. Everything they did ended up being a proof of the resurrection because as these things were circumvented, as these things were 
broken its testimony, like I said with those guys over the years who have, have accepted Christ because of the historical evidence, all of this becomes historical evidence that he truly rose from the dead. They went to great lengths to keep Jesus in the ground. But people are still going through great lengths to keep Jesus in the ground, to deny his resurrection. They come up with all kinds of crazy theories of how he may be only swooned or swooned on the cross and wasn't really dead. Some say that, oh, you know, everybody just went to the wrong tomb. Or that they all, that there was this group hallucination taking place. Seriously, these are all these theories that people come up with that are really nonsensical. But this type of things people will say, that people will believe, because they're making a moral decision, I'm not going to believe. I'm not going to believe in Jesus because to do so would mean that I have to admit I'm a sinner in need of salvation, that I need to repent of my sin, turn to Jesus Christ, turn my life over to him. But if I'm morally not willing to do that, I'm going to come up with some wackiness. And people do it all the time. Before, back in, I forget when it was written, either the 60s or 70s, there was a book book called the Passover plot and that was kind of like the Da Vinci Code of its time where you know they tried to say that Jesus purposefully fulfilled the prophecies and he was just and that's what the Passover plot was but you know things happened that Jesus physically didn't have control over like how could he control that he was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver he had no control over that physically. So, you know, that's kind of crazy. And, you know, you have people saying things like when Jesus walked on water, he was really walking on a sheet of ice that was close to the shore. And, you know, they just say, go all out on these things irrationally. They go looking for tombs in Israel with the name Jesus on it somewhere, which was a very common name in the first century. And they'll, then they'll try to say, well, that, see, that was his tomb. And that body's still in there, or there's still a bone box in there. All of this, it's just, you know, it gets to the point of irrationality. As I said, to deny the resurrection is to deny that what God really did, that he really did something to deal with our sin. Now, in verses 1 to 10 of chapter 28, we see another choice here, and that is you believe, you can believe and have your life changed. As we read in verses 1 to 4, now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The preparation day had been cut short in a hurry to place the body in the tomb. So the women were coming. They were returning to the tomb as soon as possible. We read in Luke 24, 1 to 3, to finish the preparation of the body suddenly there's an earthquake and we see this repeatedly in the scripture the earthquake taking place at these times where heaven and earth in a sense intersect 
you have this angel stepping onto the scene and it's like, <clears throat> you know, this happening. And as we saw at the crucifixion, you know, the stones breaking, earthquakes, those sort of thing. This angel descends, and here's a description. Now, I took a class in Matthew with my Greek professor at seminary. And I love his description of this because looking intensely at the language, here's what he says happened. The ladies see this angel descend. He goes over to the tomb, just casually walks over to the tomb, really doesn't pay any attention to the Roman seals. Who cares? And he takes a hold of this stone that's between probably one and a half to two tons, and he just takes it in his hands, throws it over his head, and goes and sits on it. And this is, my, this is my warped imagination. I can then see him look at the Roman guards and just kind of say, hey, guys, what's up? You know, and they go, bonk, you know, right on the ground. His incredible appearance causes these seasoned soldiers. You have to remember, you know, Roman soldiers weren't snowflakes. They had seen a lot. They've been experienced a lot. They've seen a lot of death. They've seen a lot of dying. They've probably killed a lot of people. And here they are, and they see this angel descend, toss the stone over, look at him, and they go, oh, and they pass out, you know, like an old cartoon. The angel removed the stone and the, and the tomb was empty. You see, there's actually no human witness to the resurrection itself. The angel didn't res open, he didn't take the stone away from the tomb to let Jesus out. He was already gone. He did it to let the disciples in so they could see that he had risen. No human witness to the resurrection. It's one of those things that is like just a transaction between the Father and the Son. Like those three hours on the cross. As Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? And, and then, you know, that time, those three hours where he sees the, on the cross, he's bearing the full weight of our sin and thinking about it. How can he in this time take on eternal punishment for our sin? That was taking place, that transaction between him and the Father. And again, this taking place here, we're just not told about exactly what happened. The whole thought of the resurrection, though, brings fear to those who do not believe. It's the one thing that they have to constantly be attacking. To think that there are spiritual realities that are beyond your control and there's, that there's an absolute truth that you have to deal with. That scares people. If you don't know Jesus, there is great reason to fear. Now in verses 5 through 8 we read, But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid. Now you have only one reason to say that. They were afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. 
Go then, or so then, excuse me. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. The angel tells the ladies that there's no reason to fear. Fear is that natural response to something we don't understand. We don't know what's taking place. Or we don't have control of the situation. We haven't, can't fit it into our grid, into our mental grid, so we respond in fear. He said that he knew they sought Jesus, who had been crucified. He knows why you're here. And I love from Luke 24, 5, the angel asked, looked at the ladies and asked the question, why do you seek the living among the dead? It makes no sense. Do you understand, you know? Do you understand what he said, what he told you was going to happen, what he told you was going to take place? So why do you come to a grave looking for a tomb, looking for Jesus? He's obviously not here. You don't keep living people in tombs. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, for he is risen, as he said. We create a lot of unnecessary fear and confusion when we either do not know or do not believe the word of God. That's the reason for a lot of our confusion and personal suffering. Mentally or emotionally is because we simply don't trust the word of God. Fear and faith are mutually exclusive. You either have one or the other. When the disciples freaked out because of the storm, as Jesus slept in the boat, he gets up, calms the storm, and then he says to him, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? I told you, we're going over to the other side. I didn't say, hey, let's go out and drown, okay? Trusting God's word. The angel then gives them negative evidence of the resurrection, stating, he's not here. Obviously, look, he's not here. He's risen, just as he said. Then the positive evidence that they will see him when they go to Galilee. So the ladies take off in obedience to what the angel said with this mixture of fear and great joy. That's interesting. It's exciting to see when God steps in and does a work. That's usually the combination of emotions there. Fear because, again, you can't fit it into your grid, but realizing that the Lord's work, work that he's doing something beyond our understanding, which... It's not too difficult for him to do. That we respond in fear and great joy. They're still not exactly sure of everything that was going on. But the fear was giving way to great joy. This is what happens as you walk through the difficult circumstances of your life with Jesus and discover that he is exactly who he says he is and does exactly what he says he's going to do. The fear dissolves, the joy fills the space. We too should follow the direction of the angels here as they first said, Come and see, and then go and tell. Verses 9 and 10, we read. And as they went to tell the disciple, his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! 
So they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. As the women were on their way, Jesus met them. I love this. Charles Spurgeon wrote something to the effect of believers running in obedience are likely to meet up with Jesus. If you're running in obedience to his commands and what he's called you to do, you're likely to meet up with him. The first thing that Jesus says to him is rejoice, or maybe more literally, have joy. There's no reason to be bummed here. Have joy at what God has accomplished for you through Jesus Christ. Have joy at what he's doing in your life. Paul told the Philippians in Philippians 4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. He's saying make, you probably heard the expression, make it your choice to rejoice. It's a decision that we make. That I can either be filled with joy because my eyes are on the Lord and seeing what he's doing, what he's accomplished, or I can spend all my time bummed out because I'm looking at what's going on in the world. I mean, seriously, is there anything more ridiculous than our political situation right now? It's horrific. It's tearing our country apart. And we can look at that and say, oh, what are we going to do? You know, who do we go with? You know, who do we believe? All this. Forget the whole thing. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Because liberals don't have the answers. The conservatives don't have the answers. Because Jesus is the answer. And so as we focus on him and we see what's being accomplished in the world, we then you see as we look through those eyes, we see, man, stuff that said the Bible was in the Bible was going to happen. That's happened. I look at the Middle East, everything's lining up. Cool. Then I can look at the world through that perspective and understanding that even in the midst of this situation, no matter what I'm going through, God is working. And in that fact, I can rejoice. No matter what my immediate situation is, I can rejoice because I know that I'm saved. I know Jesus is coming back to take me home. And even if I die before then, hey, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. It's all good. I can rejoice. So even if maybe I have a physical infirmity or even if I've lost my job or whatever the crisis might be, God's still on the throne. He's in control. He loves you incredibly so much that he sent his son to die for your sins on the cross that he could have a relationship with you. It's all good. Then I love this. The first thing the women do is they fall down, grab his feet, and they worship him. Worship is not entertainment. You know, it's not for us to sit back and say, oh, I really didn't like that worship set today. Or, you know, to say this, oh, that's not my style of music, or I don't really do, you know, that's not the point. And I love it. Malcolm Wilde, the pastor in uh, Merritt Island, who was heavily involved in Jesus movement, or the Jesus, the music at the time of the Jesus movement, he was part of a group called Malcolm and Alwyn. He has said that in the past that he's had people come up to him in his church and they'll say, oh, I really liked worship today. And his response to him is, oh, that's great, but it wasn't for you. 
You know, the point of worship is, again, is not entertainment. Yes, we should do it as well as we can. We, but the point is, it's focused to the Lord. We're worshiping the Lord. We're not worshiping worship. It's addressed to the Lord. It's an expression of the realization of who Jesus is and what he's accomplished. And when these ladies realized that there is Jesus standing before them, risen from the dead, what else could they do but fall at his feet and worship? You know, you hear people say in conversations, oh, when I get to heaven, I'm going to go see Aunt Harriet or I'm going to talk to this person. Oh, I'd really like to talk to Paul the Apostle. That's not, my first, that's not what I'm going to be doing first. And I don't think it's going to be what any of us are doing first. When we get there, we're standing before Jesus. Like the song, I can only imagine. You know... I stand in your presence or to your feet while I fall. I think that's the answer. We're going to fall at his feet in worship. Just to think. Being before the God of the universe, the one who created us, and then the one who died for our sins and rose from the dead so that we could be forever in his presence. When you get into his presence, what are you going to do? You're not going to go and say, Lord, I don't really understand what you were doing in my life on January 14th, 1997. No, you're going to be, I'm going to be on my face. I have nothing of my own to offer him, to argue with him. What's the point? I would be wrong. Just worship. And that's what worship is about. Failure to worship simply demonstrates spiritual ignorance. Then Jesus repeats the direction of the um, angels. It says, go and tell my brethren. And this is exciting, too, because this is the first time in the scripture Jesus refers to believers as my brethren. There's the relationship now. Full assurance of relationship. The point is that there are no worries. But all this has been accomplished according to the plan of God. That's why Jesus says to his disciples in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You have a promise right there, just as valid as the promise he gave to the disciples to rise from the dead. That he's coming again to receive us to himself. And now in verses 11 through 15, we see that people try then to deny the work of God, as it says in verse 11. Now, while they were going, while the ladies were going to the disciples, it says, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. These guys go to the chief priests. You know, it says some of them, so others were probably hiding out somewhere out of fear. So the guard describes everything that happens to the chief priest. 
And it always amazes me the different reactions that people have to the same event. But these guys, these chief priests, they respond in self-serving unbelief. But others will respond like the ladies in faith that results in joy. In verses 12 through 14, we then read, When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, referring to the chief priest here, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they have this mutual agreement here. The council gets together and decides to pay off the guards to tell the story that they were asleep and the body was stolen. The bribes had to be or the bribe had to be a large amount of money because this was a huge risk these soldiers were taking. Because if they actually were asleep, the penalty was death of falling asleep on your watch. That's how important being on watch was to the Romans. And here we really see the darkness in the hearts of these Jewish leaders. As Romans 1, 18 through 19 tells us that they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. But look at this. Their story makes no sense. While we were asleep, the disciples came and took the body. If you were asleep, how do you know that? It makes no sense. You're either asleep and you have no clue, or you're awake, and you saw it happen. You can't have it both ways. But people often choose the ridiculous in order to maintain their unbelief. People will make choices like, you know, believing, the thing today is for people to believe in individual truth. Oh, I have my truth, and you have your truth rather than believing in what's referred to as transcendent truth, one truth that's over all. And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He's the truth. It's simple as that. There's no one truth for me, another for you. Jesus is who he says he is. He did what he said he's going to do. That's it. That's it. A person can't say, well, that's not my truth. It's like, I, it always blows me away that people don't do that with any other area of study other than theology or understanding God. You, you'll have, you won't have anyone in the math class saying, you know, I just really don't believe in algebra. Or I don't believe two and two equals four. That's your truth. That's not mine. You look at them like they were idiots because it makes no sense. It, neither does it make any sense for someone to say, is you have your truth, I have mine, and it really doesn't matter. In verse 15 we read, so they took the money and did as they were instructed and this saying was commonly reported among the Jews to this day. Rain. The resurrection was an unusual situation for the guards. And rather than dealing with it face to face, they wanted to focus on things that they knew rather than things that they this was out of the ordinary, so they went, hey, we're used to dealing with money, issues like that. Let's just focus on that. Let's focus on the practical in their minds, rather than deal with the reality of the resurrection. That is why some have gone to great lengths to deny or to play down the importance of the resurrection. If Jesus is who he says 
he is and did what he said he was going to do, rising from the dead, then our lives should be totally changed in the light of that truth. It should change the way I treat my family. It should change the way I do business. It should change the way I live my life as a whole. I should get my marching orders from the Lord. But if you're looking for an excuse for unbelief, you'll find it somewhere. And it won't matter how illogical or ridiculous it is. So what are you going to do with a risen Savior? Are you going to pro seek to prevent his working in your life? That call that he's placed on your heart? Are you going to believe and surrender your life to him and be transformed? Or are you going to seek to deny and cover up what's been done so that you continue can continue to live for yourself in your sin? Your choice does not change the truth, but it'll change you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much again for your word, but thank you especially what you've accomplished for us through your son who came here, lived a perfect life, died for our sins on the cross, was buried, rose again on the third day. That statement, that, this, that sacrifice was accepted, rose again for our justification, that whoever believes in him, whoever puts their faith and trust in him alone for their salvation will have everlasting life and will spend eternity in heaven with you. Lord, we thank you for that, Lord, and we worship you. For you're an incredibly <clears throat> loving father not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We thank you for that, Lord. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If anyone's in further need of prayer, I'd love to pray with you afterwards. If you don't have this relationship with Jesus that we've been talking about, that I've been describing and explaining how you can, Love to pray with you. Love to introduce you to Jesus. Let's stand as we worship the Lord.